Recording in progress. Welcome everyone. I'm Alison Cuellar, George Mason University, and this, are, this is our uh, final session in our summer health policy series of welcome. In fact, we have Marcus Plesha joining us today he, um, from the um, Association for State and Territorial Health Organizations, and he will be moderating our session on public health lessons learned. Let me turn it over to you, Marcus. Great, thanks very much, Jeremy. Thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's good to see everybody. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and quick, quickly, uh, since we're running a little late, go ahead and quickly uh, introduce briefly our three panelists today, and we'll have a short presentation from each of them going in the order in which I introduce them, and then we will open things up for a question and answer. So we're very lucky to have three very experienced panelists today who bring great perspective from different aspects of, of this particular issue. Uh, the first up will be Dr. Bashara Shukair. Um, Dr. Shukair is the White House COVID-19 vaccination coordinator. Uh, Dr. Shukair is very well known to us in the field of public health, um, having served in, in innovative position, leadership positions, both at Kaiser Permanente, and then prior to that for five years as the uh, commissioner of the Department of Public Health in Chicago. Uh, next up after that, we will have Dr. Ruben Varghese. Uh, Dr. Varghese has, is the public health director at the Arlington County uh, Public Health Division, and he has been the public health director for 16 years, which is impressive. Uh, congratulations on that. That's a great tenure. Um, and he'll be speaking a little bit from the local perspective. And then finally, we'll have uh, Sharon Lamberton, who is the vice, deputy vice president of state government affairs for the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association of America. Um, this is a trade association that represents more than 37 biopharmaceutical companies uh, and which is located in Washington, DC. And um, Ms. Lamberton has a wide range of previous experience in government and actually was at George Washington University, uh, George Mason University for a little while. So uh, we're glad to have her back. So um, the, the full uh, bios are in your materials if you want to look more closely, but I will go ahead and we'll have uh, Dr. Shukair start off with his uh, comments. All right. Well, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be uh, with you all today. Um, I'll be here for um, the first part of the meeting. Unfortunately, I can't be staying until the end, but I know the theme of today's discussion is about lessons uh, learned, and I'll share some of the lessons that we've learned through our national vaccination um, effort. So I'm going to talk about what we've learned over the course of this vaccination campaign. Um, and, and so when you think comparing to when the president came into office to today, we're in a very, very different place. We've um, had to evolve our strategies significantly as um, the situation has changed. So I'll walk us through the evolution of our thinking based on uh, what we are uh, learning. So let me start with where we, where we are today. More than 342 million doses of the vaccines have been administered. 69% of adults in this country have had at least one shot and that's 163 million people who are fully vaccinated. We have 20 states, the District of Columbia, and three territories, Puerto Rico, Guam, and Palau, that have reached the 70% of adults with at least uh, one shot. But when we came into office back in, la in late January, it was a very different world. Only 17 million shots have been administered at the time, and through most of the country, only healthcare workers and residents of long-term care facilities were eligible to receive the vaccine. So how did we get to where we are now? Um, a place of incredibly significant progress, but also, of course, a place where there's still a lot of work uh, to do. So from the beginning, we were focused on getting shots as uh, quickly as possible into people's arms and as equitably as possible through three big areas of focus. For, that's what we focused on first, vaccine supply, number of people who are vaccinating, and the number of access points for people to get a shot. So let me touch on all of these. So on the supply, we bought enough vaccines for all adults to be delivered by the end of May, and we've leveraged the Defense Production Act to get the equipment manufacturers needed to increase and accelerate production. 
Um, on the vaccinator side, we signed orders to allow retired doctors, nurses uh, to return to service to give shots, as well as to allow pharmacists, dentists, senior medical students, and other professionals to, to vaccinate. And we've deployed literally 10,000 or more federal and active military personnel to support vaccinations, including over 2,500 folks um, to serve as vaccinators. And we funded thousands of National Guard members to serve as vaccinators at the state level as well. So that was the focus on supply and focus on vaccinators. Now, the third big area of focus from the get-go was creating more places for people to get their shots. So we've provided more than $5.6 billion to 58 states, localities, tribes, and territories to support and increase their vaccination efforts. We've provided federal staffing or financial support for over 900 uh, community vaccination centers. And we stood ourselves 39 high volume federally run mass vaccination sites. At the same time, we've launched a program to directly send doses to 21 pharmacy companies, now reaching over 40,000 activated stores focused on stores and high risk zip codes. Uh, we've also launched a program to directly send vaccine to community health centers nationwide, uh, which provide healthcare to our most underserved communities. At the same time, we've also deployed and supported literally thousands and thousands of mobile pop-up clinics in underserved communities, including uh, rural areas. And we've done that through FEMA, the Veteran Affairs, community health centers, as well as our federal pharmacy partners. So because of these efforts very early on, you know, this was end of January and February and March and April, by beginning of May, we have gone from only healthcare professionals and residents of long-term care facilities being eligible to receive a vaccine to pretty much every adult being eligible for vaccination everywhere in the country. 90% of people now had a vaccine site within five miles of where they lived. And by that time in early May, more than half of all adults have gotten at least one shot and one third were fully vaccinated. Um, we were able to meet the president's 100 day goal of 200 million shots in arms in just 92 days. And there would be more than enough vaccine supply to vaccinate every adult who wanted one by the end of that uh, month. Now, of course, um, this was a very new environment to what we were facing in prior months. Supply by that time was readily available, and many, if not a lot, of the people who are most eager to get a shot uh, through far from all of the far from all of them had gotten uh, one. So at that point, we learned through all of this, and we needed to shift to uh, this new reality. When at one point supply and the number of vaccinators were a critical focus by May, our priorities shifted to focus on access, making getting vaccinated as convenient as possible, and relatedly shifting from high throughput mass vaccination sites to smaller sites in the communities meeting where people they are. So access was one big focus for us in May. The second big focus that became clearly that we need to spend time and energy on is building vaccine confidence and making sure that everyone who was on the fence about getting vaccinated had their questions and concerns addressed. And the third piece, which is an integral part of our strategy, was equity and making sure that we have strategies that were tailored to reach the most underserved communities across the country. So, so what did this mean for us in practice? You know, we've kind of evolved by that time into this new sets of strategy. So let me just talk a little bit about what we've done around each one of those and how the learnings from the prior months helped us get there. So first to improve access and make it even easier for people to get vaccinated and meet people where they are, we worked, for example, with our federal retail pharmacy partners to offer no appointment, walk-in vaccinations available at the vast majority of the 40,000 local pharmacies participating in the federal pharmacy program. Um, we've supported vaccination clinics with community-based organizations, faith-based organizations across the country, as well as on-campus vaccination clinics at many of the nation's largest community colleges. Um, and we've done on-site clinics at businesses. So if you think about it to date, 
There's been more than 10,000 pharmacy-led mobile clinics. There's been over 96 million shots administered by our federal pharmacy partners since that program started. And we've expanded direct vaccine distribution to reach over 1,000 community health centers spanning pretty much every state where over 73% of the vaccines administered through this community health center program were going to racial and ethnic minorities. And we've hosted over 10,000 pop-up community vaccination events through um, our community health centers. We've administered more than five and a half million shots through this federal allocation to community health centers and over 13 million shots through community health centers overall. So lots of great work there. Uh, we've also at that time started being very engaged in helping states activate significantly more primary care docs as vaccinators. They are absolutely critical to the vaccination effort. So I'm gonna come back to that in a, um, in a moment. So also in that timeline, we launched two new tools to help people get vaccinated, a number to text your zip code to and get texted back three vaccine sites nearby. And we've also launched vaccines.gov to find sites and to get more information. So that was on the access piece. Now, we also knew that we needed to focus on vaccine confidence, and that's why we started investing resources. Um, you know, for example, we've done $130 million in funding for trusted national and local organizations to support improved vaccination education efforts. We've invested $250 million in funding for states to help them power their own vaccine confidence efforts. Last week, we've announced $100 million to fund vaccine outreach efforts in rural health clinics to reach the rural communities. We've invested $250 million to hire community health workers who live in those communities that they serve. Um, and um, uh, the other part that was also important here is to bring those folks who are supporting and understanding the hardest hit and highest risk individuals and prepare for future public health uh, challenges. Now, on top of that, we've also launched a nationwide grassroots network of local vo uh, voices, trusted community leaders to encourage people to get vaccinated. You might have heard of the COVID-19 Community Corps, which is a program where trusted voices in communities across the country receiving updated public health information to be able to share with their communities to help get their friends, their family, their followers um, vaccinated. These are the folks who are receiving materials like toolkits, FAQs, social graphics to help them deliver fact-based information um, to their networks, and they've been an integral part of that, of that effort. And then the third part at that stage of the campaign was really focused on equity, which continues to be a critical component of all of our work across all initiatives. So we've done things like FEMA increasing the number of mobile sites, establishing smaller and pop-up vaccination sites with the focus on hardest to reach individuals, including uh, rural areas. You might have heard some of our efforts to uh, make free childcare uh, available so people can get vaccinated. And we've also delivered more than $6 billion in American Rescue Plan funding to about 1,400 community health centers to expand access to vaccines to the most underserved communities. So these areas of focus carried us through the month of June and got us the 67% of US adults uh, vaccinated. And a point where nearly everyone who wanted to get vaccinated had gotten a shot. And we now needed more focus on those who are on the fence about getting a shot. So we continued to learn and evolve our strategies and got to the point where we are today well, it's all about helping improve confidence by leveraging trusted messengers and effective messaging that's tailored to the community, um, zip code by zip code and block by block. And that leads me to want to talk about a key part of our efforts currently, which is about engaging primary care providers and health systems that I've referenced earlier as a key part um, of the stakeholder engagement effort. So we know that Primary care docs continue to be essential to our vaccination efforts um, for the simple fact, you know, PCPs are the most trusted sources of COVID-19 vaccine information. Surveys confirm that uh, by a large margin. Um, this is consistent across communities and geographies. People want to hear from their doctors. 
the people who have reliably provided them care month after month, year after year. But that's not the only reason providers are so important. PCPs are critical, not just as trusted messengers, but also as vaccinators. You know, their offices are incredibly convenient to get vaccinated and millions of unvaccinated people are visiting their doctors every month. Uh, we also know PCP offices are the number one preferred place to get vaccinated, including uh, people who are less confident about the vaccine. So we've worked with the CDC, we've provided technical assistance to states um, in partnership with ASTO, the State um, 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 Association of, of State and, and um, uh, Health Officers, to help them activate primary care providers, including family docs and pediatricians as vaccinators and vaccine ambassadors. And we're working with organizations like the American Medical Association, um, American Academy of Family Physicians, um, American Academy of Pediatricians to help providers enroll, set up their offices as vaccine clinics and proactively reach out to their patients about getting vaccinated. And at the same time, we've worked with other large associations on a number of vaccine related commitments. For example, the American Medical Group Association representing medical groups and health systems that provide care to about a third of the US population. This, the AMGA reached out to their members to commit to taking actions, including proactively reaching out to their unvaccinated patients and redoubling efforts to encourage healthcare colleagues to get vaccine. And within a week, more than 162 medical groups representing 103,000 physicians caring for more than 64 million patients signed on uh, to act. Another example is the Alliance of Community Health Plans, which represents the nation's top performing nonprofit health plans. They also sent, a call, um, sent out a call to action to its members with a combined 24 million members in 36 states and their members committed to a similar set of efforts including the use of data to identify unvaccinated, underserved, rural, and low-income members and proactively reaching out to them through robocalls, emails, texts, and social media. And the final example I'll mention is we're seeing more and more hospitals committing to many of the best practices for improving vaccine uptake, including vaccinations upon discharge from the hospitals, vaccinations at emergency departments, and distributing shots to hospital-affiliated primary care providers. And as a result of these efforts and of the collaboration across state and local government, public health and provider health systems, in the last few months, we've nearly doubled the number of medical practices receiving and administering vaccine, and we'll continue um, to build on that progress. And then one last topic um, uh, I was asked to address in this discussion, I wanna make sure to I touch on as well is changes to the public health infrastructure through the American Rescue Plan. So we've made a number of large investments in public health, both to address the pandemic as well as the long term. So for example, we've invested $7 billion to hire and train public health workers, including $4.4 billion to allow states and localities to expand their overstretched public health departments with additional staff to support the pandemic response efforts and to support the development of next generation of public health leaders. Um, we've also invested $3 billion to create a new grant program that will facilitate federal investment in the people and expertise needed at the state and local levels to expand, train, and modernize public health workforce for the future. Um, we've also invested $1.7 billion to fight variants, including $1 billion to expand genomic sequencing through CDC partnerships with the laboratory and the state, uh, laboratory community and the state laboratories. Um, that also included $400 million to support innovative initiatives and cutting edge research into genomic epidemiology, which will allow us to launch six new innovative centers of excellence in genomic epidemiology, which will operate as partnerships between state health departments and academic um, institutions. And these types of partnership will allow us to focus on developing new genomic surveillance tools. And then, um, you know, we've also invested $300 million to build and support a national bioinformatics infrastructure to create a unified system for sharing and analyzing sequence data in a way that protects privacy, but still allows for informed decision uh, making. Um, 
So this is the type of investments that we've made on the long term for public health, and that comes on top of the $250 million to hire community um, health workers. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Shakir. And I know your time is- Finally, um, oh, sorry. Um, what I'll, um, um, in, in closing, just want to do two quick uh, parting thoughts here. One, uh, we need to end this pandemic as soon as possible. That's why we're continuing to go full speed, pushing on our confidence work and activating primary health care and health systems. Um, this is also why we're sending surge response teams to states that are having outbreaks. And it's why we are doing everything we can to combat misinformation. And second, we need to ensure that we are prepared and ready for any public health crisis that could emerge in the future. And this is why we have made such a large investments in the public health infrastructure. So thank you for allowing me to join today. We have a lot of work ahead and we will only be successful if we do this together. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, I have to drop off, but I look forward to learning more about how this conversation goes. Great, thanks very much. And sorry, you, you had a little pause there. I thought you were finished. I didn't mean to cut in, but thank you for joining us. And, and yeah, uh, sorry that you have to leave, but we really appreciate the, the time on the panel. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over now to Dr. Varghese to give us some comments from his perspective at the local level. All right, thank you, Dr. Plesha. Um, if we can go on to the first slide, I only have two. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I just have four points more for um, people to think about. Um, and they'll probably be controversial, but I think it applies to the entire period of the pandemic. I think people are finding out as a subtitle, science values and the true reality of decision-making. Expertise, and this will be kind of controversial, has not died is one of the things that I'm gonna say, but we have to keep that in mind, expertise or or sometimes what some people consider science is to inform decision-making. But I think sometimes we think the scientific findings substitute for individual or population level, in this case, political decision-making. And I think we've got to stop making that false uh, equivalency because expertise and what we value may not always be the same, although some people value expertise solely. But I think I've discovered in the end from my work in clinical days, I had to remind myself that the only expert about the patient in the end was themselves. They have to put the facts and the values together. Next point, trust in public health. We need to meet the populations where they are, even if it is tough to do so. And pandemic has stretched our limits. But I wanna remind people, and I have to remind myself sometimes, we're healthcare providers in our information services roles first and foremost. Role confusion doesn't help. I think sometimes we get into policy wonking or actually getting into politics. All are important to public health, but if we're gonna be trusted, um, we have to remember we're seen as healthcare providers. So we can't just give up that role. We know that people are not monolithic in their responses. That should not be surprising. And that should be why we should tailor things, even if it does take more time, or as I said, even if it's tough to do. Robbing from the, for those who don't recall seeing it this way, SDOH stands for, in my world, um, social determinants of health and the equity literature. We must create the trust conditions so that the default choice made by a person is the healthy choice. It's easier said than done, especially during the crisis. And that leads to the point that a good mentor of mine, Jeff Lake, uh, when he hired me at the Virginia Department of Health, would say, the best time to make a friend is before you need one. Relationship building is about being effective, not efficient. So let's keep that in mind. And we need populations um, to know um, that, hang on, just caps in the way. Uh, the best time, uh, we need populations of people to trust that we are and will be right, credible, and first with our information. That's a tough order, a tall order, but anyone with risk communication expertise will see that's where it comes from. And that's what we have to do with our expert information for their sake, not for our own agenda. We can go on to the next slide. So the next slide, the next point is, quote unquote, informed consent. Typically, we think about it for individuals, but I'm going to say that we need to think about it for populations and their health as we do with individuals. Unless there is a political mandate, the decision is up to the individual 
and those individuals make up various populations. We must always aim to provide the information in a culturally sensitive way to allow for informed decisions that is informed consent. And I think as you just heard um, in the previous um, uh, presentation, in some ways, we've got multiple populations and multiple people to deal with and what motivates them is going to be different and tailoring that message becomes tough. In my final push, I thought for those of you from the GMU community at least, if there's a resource agenda, research agenda or the what we need, aka my ask of you, here are the things that I would have you consider. How to deal with the realities I just talked about in light of these additional things, the literacy level of our populations, Compared to most places, we have an extremely literate population. So Arlington is somewhere between 70 and 76% in vaccination of the eligible population. Is that acceptable? Two, we need to continue to acknowledge that we are not linear thinkers. And three, we need to reckon with personal values. And that point here is how to account for the clinical or population level significance must take into account values which are typically, quote unquote, adjusted for with respect to statistical significance. Remember that clinical significance and statistical significance are not interchangeable. We in public health, just as much as in medicine, need to keep that first and foremost in our mind and that of others. And what we're talking about is behavior change. And we know this takes sustained individual and societal effort going in the same direction to achieve. And no, we are not monolithic individuals. And some of us, than others. I applaud my community being at 70%. However, I won't be satisfied until we're somewhere above 90, 95%, if that's possible. So we can use your help with applied research in these areas. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Varghese. And now we'll go to Ms. Lamberton for our third. Good afternoon, everyone. It is so great to be on the panel and hear the incredible expertise from everyone. I really appreciated hearing Ruben and um, and and hearing uh, Bashara and and really um, all the work that ASPO is doing. Dr. Flesh, I, I really have to commend you and all of your colleagues for the great work during this un, um, this unbelievable time. My talk today is to kind of give you an idea of what we did as a biopharmaceutical industry when the pandemic was declared and what we've learned to date. We represent Pharma, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, which are about 33 biopharmaceutical companies throughout the country. And when this pandemic was first declared, I'll tell you, after 20 years of being in this particular business and as a registered nurse by training who worked at National Institutes of Health on clinical trials before that, I have never seen anything like it where people mobilize our industry scientists, our companies are typically competitive racing each other to get the newest brand treatments and cures to market. We join hands, we work with folks from all over the world to bring together at vaccines and treatments that we saw under a year, which was remarkable. Um, I really appreciate Dr. Queller for inviting me to be here as a, as a George Mason alumni. I am really impressed with the work that you all are doing. And I hope that um, I can give you some insight on what our industry has done. And when I tell you about how we, a lot of people think pharma is just involved in the manufacturing and the science of the of medicines, but honestly, we've been involved in the diagnostic and testing. We looked at repurposing what medicines we had, specifically antivirals and things used to treat HIV to see if this would be effective against this virus. When we looked and decoded this, this uh, COVID virus in less than four months, which took SARS about 14 months to decode, we then quickly went to work at figuring out what kind of vaccines could be effective. A lot of folks didn't ever know about mRNA, but it's been around since the 1980s. It's just not a sexy technology until now since COVID, but mRNA is an amazing technology. Two of our three vaccines that have EUA, emergency use authorization, uses that. And the third one being viral vectors. 
We also looked at treatments. We would be remiss at just focusing on vaccines. Many people didn't have a chance to get a vaccine. Many people cannot have a vaccine, but what do those folks need? They need effective treatments and treatments that we've seen receive emergency use authorization have reduced hospitalization and death by 70%. So again, amazing innovation. When we looked at these vaccines, um, and, um, a lot of folks said, okay, Sharon, you take 12, 12 to 15 years to bring a drug from bench to bedside in a vaccine on average, five to seven years. You brought a vaccine in less than a year. You brought monoclonal antibodies or other treatments in less than a year. How does that happen without truly cutting corners? I guarantee you, we did not cut corners. The FDA is a gold standard agency of the world that has unparalleled safety record. And they did not want anything to be introduced into the public unless it went through the appropriate standards. And I am so happy that, that we were able to do so, but a key to doing that quickly was because we manufactured the medications or vaccines before getting the green light of approval. A lot of people say, that's crazy. Why would you do millions of vaccines and treatments without getting the green light? You could have had to burn that out if, if rejected or if it denied. And that is true, but I'm sure glad it was a risk that our companies and others felt worth taking because it was all the more quickly that we would be able to get those shots into arms that needed it and treatments into the bodies that needed it. So ramping up manufacturing capacity was something I've never seen done in my 20 years where people are manufacturers produce the medicines before receiving authorization or approval. So this was key to getting that within the 12 month window. I would also be remiss if I didn't talk about the diversity that is needed in clinical trials. As a registered nurse and one that worked at National Institutes of Health, I saw how important it is that your patient population for which you are doing clinical trials should reflect the population that receives the treatment. And we know with COVID, it disproportionately impacts those communities with color of color. And we needed to make sure that our clinical trials had enough diversity, not just of race, but of medical diversity. We wanted those that had asthma, pre-existing conditions, comorbidities, obesity. We needed to see a plethora of medical conditions. So we knew how these vaccines and treatments would work on a variety of patient populations. So our member companies who've been doing clinical trials that last three phases, and again, about 10 to 12 years, um, with only a 12% success rate. That's right, 88% of medicines fail. So only 12% make it. And 95% of vaccines fail, only 5% make it. So it's a risky, expensive business. However, it was important that we made sure that we design our trials to have that diversity that I referenced. And this is a commitment that we've had, but we continue to pledge that we will do that going forward, not just on COVID treatments and vaccines, but on a variety of other medical conditions and diseases. So this is an important principle um, of clinical trial principles. It's not a document that gets dusty and lays on a shelf. It's something that's a living document and a commitment I'm very proud that our companies have made and continue to use and work on. We also looked at, in addition to coming up with the new treatments and vaccines, we looked at how do we share this data with the scientists across the world in real time? A lot of folks say, well, you've got your green light for emergency use authorization. We know that Pfizer and Moderna have applied for full approval. That's VLA, which is basically a full approval of the medication, which might help improve vaccine hesitancy. But that continuing and monitoring that our manufacturers does continues way beyond that EUA or approval. It's years past the approval or green light that the FDA gives us. So we continue to make sure our safety profile of those medicines and vaccines continue to improve. And if there's one slight bit of concern, we stop those clinical trials, as you've seen, with AstraZeneca, when we stopped that with spinal cord inflammation, when we saw that with what was one patient that had undiagnosed MS and another patient that had an unrelated to the vaccine spinal cord inflammation, but how did we know? We didn't know. So the trials were absolutely stopped for several weeks before they continued. And that safety is something I'm very proud of and needs to be really um, extolled um, 
to the public to increase that confidence because safety, again, is unparalleled within our FDA and our science community. This number actually changes every week, and I wish I had the better slide, which shows you that it's 1,833 clinical trials that are in, in place for vaccines and treatments. Now you might say, Sharon, why do you need that? You have three vaccines already approved, or at least EUAs. You have three treatments, up to 10 treatments, actually, three monoclonal antibodies. Why not just stop and just really focus on manufacturing enough for the world? Well, it's important because we this while it's approved and while we have those medications approved, not all of those medicines are appropriate for third world countries that might require different refrigeration and storage or handling requirements. So having these medicines in clinical trials will not only ha help with our COVID pandemic, it's not if, it's when we might see another pandemic that we have these medicines in the pipeline that can be ready and deployed and manipulated, adjusted for the virus that might be coming next. And this is very important to show this healthy, robust research and development pipeline. I can't tell you how important it is. This innovation is unparalleled. Now you might say, Sharon, of those 1,833 clinical trials, how many are in the US? Over 400 are in the US. So again, this represents a global view, but really important because we don't know this is it with COVID. We don't know. You've heard Dr. Fauci this week talk about being prepared for the next one. How do you do that? Right here, looking at this research and development healthy pipeline, looking at collectively employing those best practices that we've learned over the past year and moving forward together. This slide is important because it shows you it's not a one size fits all for vaccines. You all might be familiar with the flu vaccine where the CDC comes up with three different concoctions of a flu that might be seen that year. And they use an inactivated or an attenuated vaccine. We, as I mentioned earlier, have two of the three vaccines that are using mRNA technology that manipulates or works with instructing the body using the genetic code to recognize that virus and be able to fight against it should you encounter COVID. That's mRNA, amazing. Not to mention the amazing potential it has for cancer and other conditions. Yet there's also more things in, in progress. We have the protein subunit. There are so many different ways that the body can, can be you, you, we can work with the body to have immunity against this virus and others. So it's important that you look at the whole picture of the different technologies that are out there and that need to be promoted, protected, incentivized as we move forward to making sure that our world is a safer place as we continue to see these mutations um, move and, and, and go further. This is a great slide, but it truly becomes outdated very quickly, but it shows you the phase one, two, and three that we all know clinical trials must go through. And it shows the different companies, not all our pharma member companies, but it shows where they are in progress of phase one, phase two, and EUA. Very exciting progress. And then finally, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the variants. We've heard about the alpha. We're hearing about the delta that now accounts for 83% of the cases that are throughout the United States, with 49, 50 of the states seeing a significant increase in delta that is more of a virulent um, mutation. We know this is becoming a pandemic of the unvaccinated because it's pretty much attacking those that have not been vaccinated. However, we're seeing some breakthrough cases for those that have been vaccinated and are getting it, but albeit at a much lesser degree. The only thing we can do is make sure that we are monitoring the spread. We continue to develop that, those new vaccines and treatments, continue the vaccinations that we we heard Bashara talk about, we need to make sure those incredible efforts, not just on the federal um, level government, but the state. Um, many of you don't know George Mason had incredible vaccination programs that they employed in working with Fairfax County Public Health, um, immunizing thousands, thousands and thousands of people in Northern Virginia. So these things that we've learned with our public health systems and how to get that vaccination out there quickly is so important especially as we hear, should there be a third booster needed for immunocompromised or those under 65? It's highly likely. 
And then finally, I'm just going to wrap up by saying that we do have the full arsenal of, of treatments. We don't just have vaccines. I've focused on, on that, but we also have the monoclonal antibodies that again, help reduce severity and reduce mortality of those that have COVID. We have antivirals and a lot of other great things to, to put to use. And my last slide here focuses on the, the, the point that many of us have seen in our own families, in our community. We've seen people impacted in this pandemic who have lost their jobs. When you lose your job, you lose insurance coverage, you lose access to medicines. So a lot of our companies have these new programs or actually the same programs, but we've expanded them. It's medication um, assistance tool, mat.org. And you can put in your medicines and see if you qualify for free or nearly free medicines. So with that said, I just thank you for your time. We have a lot of resources on our website, but I'm going to leave the rest of the time open for, um, for uh, Dr. Flesha to uh, open up for Q&A. Thank you so much for your time. Great, thank you very much uh, for, for those excellent comments from all three of our panelists. And as mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Shukair had a limited time with us and had to leave the call. Um, about, about, about half past, but uh, we've got, still got Dr. Varghese and Ms. Lamberton. Um, so I'm gonna start, there's a couple of questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a question from our audience to start with. Um, and um, Dr. Varghese, this is uh, addressed specifically to you, although we'll, we'll let Ms. Lamberton weigh in too if she wants. But uh, you know, I think you were speaking a little bit about you know, how we're effective in public health positions and leadership. And so I think this comes out of that. Uh, the person asking the question was, uh, says, since expertise is not enough to influence decision-making, what steps can researchers take to have more influence on policy and public health outcomes? And so it's sort of a question of, you know, should they, should they do more things like talking to the media or policy briefings with legislators? What are the kinds of things that the academic community and researchers can do to help with some of these policy and public health issues? Sure, it's a great question. Um, I think of expertise in, in two ways. Um, I think, are, who are we proximate to? Okay, so I think people have heard about uh, vaccine and like who may be influential, but I think it's broader than just vaccine. The talking heads, I'm gonna put myself as one of them. We have a certain uh, sphere of influence. Think of it as uh, ripples from a pebble um, in water. Who do we touch and then who do we influence? So I'd say the same thing for researchers. You've gotta be careful if you advocate for policy because you've got to start asking, are you advocating for something and who are you representing? I think we as experts have to decide Science does not dictate. Here's my primary example. I think all of the evidence suggests that hand washing reduces the risk of germ transmission. I had staff when I first joined places saying, you've got to legislate in the building that everyone wash their hands. Well, notice science doesn't translate directly into policy. And can you imagine if we had a universal requirement that everyone wash their hands? The practicality is, while I'd love that to happen, we need voluntary compliance because who's going to be the person who's going to enforce that? So you've got to be careful in your, you can lose your credibility as an expert if you are now taking sides. If they ask which could actually be more helpful to reduce X, that's fine. But we then have to remind people if in the pandemic example, we could have gone for completely communicable disease uh, squashing the curve rather than flattening the curve. But there is a consequence because then that means the social determinants of health never get dealt with if you don't have an open economy and so on. So if you're a researcher, you're going to have to be able to tell people why you're choosing one over the other and what is the consequence for not. If you don't talk about that, your credibility is lost. And that's one of the things we've got to be very careful in public health. Once you lose credibility, getting that back is going to be tough. I'll leave it there. Great, and I'm gonna I'm gonna shift and uh, have a, a follow up. Another question from Ms. Lamberton. I want to shift a little bit and talk about some sort of broader policy uh, issues that, that we may have 
learned based on the experience we've had so far. And Ms. Lambertson, you know, it, it, there were clearly some very important decisions, some of them policies, some of them funding that occurred for us to be able to move forward so quickly working with industry to develop a vaccine this fast. I mean, you alluded to that a little bit, sort of <laughs> how complex all this is and how much risk there is for industry. So, you know, I'm wondering if, what are your thoughts going forward, you know, based on what we learned from that, are there some, some policy changes that we ought to think about making based on, based on these experiences we've had so that can, we can be more effective and more ready and, and faster to develop therapeutics and vaccines in the future. Do you have any thoughts about that? That's a great question. I believe it's McKenzie that's pulling together a lot of the stakeholder comments for, for the FDA on exactly that question that you um, uh, posed, which was incredible and important because what is it, what are the lessons learned from everyone? For us, we've learned that even though we thought we were being transparent with clinical trial data, we could be more transparent. So we had many of our CEOs come out early into the pandemic and say, we are going to be an open book. Even though the public may not understand everything, we're gonna put out all the clinical data that we have that, that so to show that we're not cutting corners to be as transparent as possible because this is so important to increase vaccine confidence that if this will help, we'll do it. So that's something we've learned that to, to put it out in a way that the public will understand and that shows what we work, how we work lockstep with FDA in, in this. Um, we are not out of the woods. I know that, you know, we don't have approval for age five to 11 year olds. And just today we heard in the news that the FDA has asked both Pfizer and Moderna to have increase their clinical trials from 1,000 to 3,000 kids because we need to look at this very rare heart condition called myocarditis, inflammation of the heart lining. And you could talk about that more than I can, but it was it's important because we don't know that we'll see that same phenomenon of that rare heart condition occurring in the younger school age kids as we did with the older kids that we were vaccinating. This is an important piece before full approval or even approval is granted for that population. So um, there's a lot more that we've learned that we need, aside from being tr more transparent and giving more data on our clinical trial results, um, we also learned how important it is to make sure that we're working with the communities to eliminate barriers so that they understand when they are embarking into participating in a clinical trial, what does that mean? You are not a guinea pig. This, you have rights. This is what this clinical trial means. And we need to make sure to retain them. If they just leave, that does not help our clinical trial results nor the long term. So we need to make sure what are those barriers? And that's breaking down a lot of cultural barriers and educational barriers where we're working to figure out maybe it's technology, maybe it's simple transportation that is an issue, but let's figure it out together. And then finally, sharing that data in clinical real time you know, we've not worked routinely with the Chinese Medicine Association. This was an unusual partnership for us to work with them, with the European Medicines Association. We reached out to people we typically have not been bedfellows with. And this has been very good, important. You know, we have scientists from all over the world that we worked on because we didn't have time to have jurisdictional wars. We didn't have time to think about who's really going to get this first. We needed, it was life and death and still is. So making sure that we, those are the three highlights, I would say, on what we've learned, lessons learned, but more to come. Great. And Dr. Varghese, kind of a similar question for you, and I'll let you choose where you want to go with this. I mean, there are obviously policy issues that, that have come up and that we've learned about. There's also, thankfully, a lot of resources uh, for potential expansion of infrastructure at the local or state or even federal level. So infrastructure policy, I mean, what are you seeing in the future that it's gonna be really important for us to do to prepare for another pandemic or, or just to do our daily work of infection control well? Great question. If I hadn't converted positions over my first 15 years, because we didn't necessarily get additional resources, in fact, we had taken cuts, I wouldn't have had the bare minimum of epidemiologists to do the data analysis. During this time frame, people have forgotten. We, I still have staff working or operations working seven days a week because 
They're the staff that look at the data and see if there are trends over time. And even when the restrictions went away, we knew that it was possible that cases would go back up again. And that is what, you know, the staff are doing day in and day out, looking at the data, seeing if there's anything new. So I think people need to realize that public health, especially during crises, are working close to at least 18, seven, 18 hours per day, seven days a week. We literally were for probably three quarters of the response doing that. And that is only sustainable if you've got infrastructure because we can hire contractors, but you do need regularly experienced staff who can monitor that contract work to make sure you get the best quality um, uh, information because all of our recommendations are based on the data that we're seeing. And if we don't have good trust in that, then we're speculating. So that's how I would respond. You're on mute. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much. We're down to like one minute to go. So I, I think we're gonna go ahead and close things out here. Um, I wanted to thank both of you for your comments and, and your excellent responses to the questions. Um, my apologies, there were several questions we didn't get to in the q and A. I, I'm I'm sorry about that. Um, some of them very good, but uh, time was limited. So um, thank you for joining. And Allison, I don't know if, Dr. Quillar, I don't know if I'm handing it back to you now. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Pleasha, uh, Dr. Vigizi, and Ms. Lamberton. Really, it's been a pleasure. And um, we'll have you back again as this whole situation evolves. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.